Okay, I guess we can uh, slowly start. Uh, so welcome back to the uh, afternoon session. So we're going to have uh, uh, four talks. It's again uh, 30 minutes plus uh, 10 minutes of uh, discussion and, uh, um, and questions. Uh, so the first speaker of the session is uh, David Langlois and uh, his title is Black Hole Perturbations in Modified Gravity. So please, uh, David. Thank you, Paolo. So first, I would like to, to thank the organizer and especially uh, Valérie and, and uh, Evgeny for this, uh, for this workshop. And so I'm going to discuss about black hole perturbations in the context of uh, modified gravity, uh, and especially in the context of scalar tensor theory. So in some sense, my talk will be if I manage to, okay, to move to the next slide. So my talk will be somehow related to the, the talk uh, given yesterday by uh, Tsutomu Kobayashi. Although you will see that some aspects are, are, are complementary. Uh, so let me start with, uh, with some introduction. So as you, I guess you are all well aware, um, Gravitational wave astronomy is really a boon to, for GR, for gravity in general, as it provides a new window uh, to test general relativity and especially in the strong field regime. So there are many aspects uh, that can be used in, uh, in black hole mergers to, to get information about gravity. But here I'm going to concentrate on one phase which is uh, relatively easy to analyze which is a ring down phase so this is just after the merger of two black holes there is a single black hole which is perturbed and and uh, and that this ring down phase can be in some sense described by linear perturbation with respect to one black hole solution so this is why it's it's uh, relatively simple and it could be a, a very good uh, test for, for modified gravity. So here I'm going to concentrate on, on scalar tensor theories, and I'm going to work in the context of the, the most general framework of scalar tensor theories, which carry only one uh, scalar degree of freedom, which are the DOST theories. So I'm going to, to remind you to remind you quickly what those theories is, are, sorry, but um, Tutomu did a, an excellent job yesterday to present them. So I, I will be very quick on this. I should mention that there is um, a number of papers uh, who, which have studied the perturbation of black holes in those theories in, in the last few years. Uh, so there is a list of of them here. I hope I'm not forgetting uh, important ones. And, and, and the goal of this, uh, of this work, of the work I'm going to present, is really to, to try to, um, to extract the quasi-normal modes, what are, what are called the quasi-normal modes. And so I'm going to discuss uh, the traditional approach to quasi-normal modes, which is to use a Schrodinger-like uh, equation like like in GR, what is done usually in GR. But I'm also going to discuss an alternative approach uh, which can be used when it's uh, impossible or difficult to find a Schrodinger-like formulation. And this is a work which is based on, on two recent papers with Karim Nui and Hugo Roussi, who is a, who is a PhD student. Okay, so let me try to, to briefly, very briefly uh, summarize um, dust theories. So here I'm going to work only in the context of quadratic dust, dust theories. So quadratic means quadratic in second derivatives of the scalar field. So phi mu nu here is a short notation for the second derivative of phi. And I'm going to to write an action up to this, up to second order in phi mu nu. So if you do this, first you have the zeroth order here, which is just a k-sense uh, function, 
then you have a first order with the box phi here. Then you have the usual Ricci scala with a, with a function in, in front of it. And finally, you have the terms which are quadratic in phi menu, and, and you can construct only five, five terms. And this is just combinatorics, how to, to combine uh, two phi, phi menus with the gradients of phi and the metric. And of course, you can multiply all these Lagrangians with, with some function of x. So x is a kinetic term. So, it, so remember this notation because it's going to, to come up everywhere. And, and in principle of phi, but I'm going to, to assume some uh, shift symmetric uh, theories in the end. So what is important to remember is that those theories uh, the function which appear in this Lagrangian have to satisfy three degeneracy conditions. And this means that out of eight functions, at the end, you get only five free, free functions. So you can extend it to cubic order in phi menu, but I'm not, not going to discuss this at all in, in this talk. And just to mention that um, those theories include most of the of the non-models of scalar tensor theories, including, for example, quadratic Hordensky, uh, which is a specific case here with this choice of function. So you see that almost all the A's are zero, except the first two, which are related to the function f in front of the Ricci scalar. So something very important uh, I would like to emphasize concerning uh, those theories is the property uh, to make field redefinition. So essentially, this uh, Lagrangian depends on the metric and on a scalar field. And so it's always interesting to be aware of what's going on when you do a field redefinition. And here, a kind of natural field redefinition, since you have a metric and you have a scalar field, is to combine uh, the original metric with the gradient of the scalar field to get a new metric. So it means in, in, in particular that this, if you start from some action, let's say S tilde here, which is a functional of phi and G tilde mu nu, you can very easily get a new action, which would be a, a functional of phi and G mu nu, just by substituting here, each time you have G tilde, you substitute this, this combination, okay? And what is very important is that the dust uh, family of theories is complete under this, this formal transformation, under this field redefinition. So for example, if you consider Hondesky theories, you, this is incomplete in the sense that if you do a disformal transformation of uh, Hondesky theories, then you end up outside of Hondesky. Okay, it's on, only for a restrictive um, field redefinition that you you remain inside Hondesky. So by contrasting with the dust family, you have the full, uh, you have the full space of theories. Uh, another point I would like to emphasize is, of course, these uh, two actions here are equivalent in vacuum if you don't include matter. But as, as soon as you include matter, if you consider two theories which are disformally related, and in each case, you consider matter which is minimally coupled, first to the metric G mu nu, and in the second case to the metric G T mu nu, then you see that the two theories are physical, physically inequivalent. Okay, so it's just not another way to rewrite the same thing. It's physically inequivalent simply because you, uh, you couple minimally the matter to a different metric. So let's, let me discuss now black holes and, and uh, black hole solutions. So as it was mentioned this morning by, by Enrico, um, there are many no hair theorems in, uh, in the context of this, uh, of this uh, theories, but it's possible to find black hole solution with a non-trivial scalar field. And here I'm going to consider a metric of this form here. So what you have to keep in mind is this function A of R. 
And I'm going to consider a profile for the scalar field, which contains an explicit time dependence. And so this was introduced in, in particular by, by uh, Evgeny and, and Christos a while ago. And this is possible. So it, it seems to break uh, uh, staticity, but in fact, this is possible if you have a shift symmetric theory, because in a shift symmetric theory, you don't see directly phi, but you see only the gradient, the derivative of phi. And you see immediately that the gradient of phi is going to be time independent. Okay, so, so I'm going to consider Q. Q can be non zero in the context of shift symmetry. And then I'm going to illustrate, uh, I'm going to take two examples in the rest of the talk, just to illustrate um, the, the general formalism I'm going to discuss. So one is a, is a model of what is called stealth Schwarzschild, where the metric is exactly the, the usual Schwarzschild metric. And x, the kinetic term, is going to be a constant here. So you can obtain this solution with this function f. And I'm also going to discuss another solution, so a solution which is different from, from Schwarzschild, uh, which was obtained in this paper here. And this solution is going is given by this, uh, this uh, metric function here. So you see that it looks like a riser nostrum metric, except that you have a, a plus here and not a minus. So R minus is positive here. But so in riser nostrum you would have a minus, here you have a plus. Okay. And in this case, the kinetic term is going to, to, to change with, with, uh, with the radius. So let me discuss the perturbations here. So first I'm going to recall very quickly what, what we do in GR. So since we are in a static background, it's it's useful to do a Fourier, a time Fourier transform and to work in frequency. Uh, frequency domain. And then uh, the perturbations can be separated into two classes of perturbations, depending on their behavior with respect to parity. So one sector is the axial or odd sector. And it can be described by this uh, metric perturbations in a specific gauge, which is a traditional gauge, the so-called Reggie Wheeler gauge. And the second sector is called the polar or even sector, and it is described, so you can al also fix the gauge, and this is described by four metric functions and the scalar field perturbations. So the scalar field perturbation is zero in the axial, in the axial sector, but is non zero in general in, in, in the polar sector. So uh, in GR, uh, the situation is the following. If you write the linearized Einstein equations, you get um, a system of equations. And in fact, from the, the system of equation, you can extract uh, two equations, which are independent. And all the other equations can be derived from these two independent equations. So it means you get a system, which is um, a system of two first order equations, so first order with respect to R, to the, the radial coordinate, um, for these two quantities here. Okay, so for the two metric perturbations, so one, one is just rescaled by, by one over omega. And, and what is nice, and this was shown by the uh, seminal paper by Reggie and Wheeler a long time ago, is that you can recast these two equations by choosing an appropriate um, a function, you can recast an appropriate coordinate, which is just the usual tortoise coordinate. You can recast the system into a second order equation of motion with respect to the tortoise coordinate, uh, which looks like a Schrodinger equation with some potential. And this is the shape of the potential that you can see on the right here. And this potential goes to zero at the horizon. So the horizon corresponds to minus infinity in, for the tortoise coordinate. And it also goes to zero at infinity. So it means in, asymptotically at the horizon at infinity, you have a very simple equation uh, because the potential is zero. 
and you can write immediately the asymptotic solution. So, so you have two asymptotic solutions, one at the horizon and one at spatial infinity. And the form is the same. You can recognize an outgoing mode. So this is just a radial wave and an ingoing mode. So now the definition of the quasi-normal modes, what, what are called quasi-normal modes, is that you impose some special boundary conditions. You impose that there is no ingoing wave uh, at infinity. So it means you will impose that B at infinity zero. And you impose that there is no outgoing wave from the horizon. So it means that A at the horizon is zero. And when you implement these uh, boundary conditions, you, you find that only a discrete set of omegas are allowed. And, and they also contain an imaginary part simply because in some sense, uh, due to the emission of gravitational wave, the oscillation of the black holes are going to decay with time. So let's, let's move now. So let's, let's leave uh, GR and go to, to dust theories. So first I'm going to discuss axial modes. So this part of the talk will be uh, very, uh, very similar to what uh, Tsutomu discussed uh, yesterday, except that the way we, we find the, we treat the perturbation is different. So here we work directly with the equation of motion, not with uh, the Lagrangian of, of the perturbations. So the structure of the equation for the axial modes is very similar to GR, except it's slightly more complicated. In particular, there is a psi function, which is zero in GR, and which now is non-zero. So if you want to try to rewrite it in the Schrodinger form, we can use a, a change of function. So in some sense, this is like a change of basis in, in the two-dimensional um, vector space. And by, by doing a, an appropriate change of basis, you can, you can get the equation in this form. The system can be written in this form. But if you want to, to get a, a Schrodinger-like equation, you need to put, you see that the diagonal is a problem. But it turns out that you can get rid of these diagonal terms just by doing a time redefinition. Okay, so you, you modify the, the time. And in this way, you can get rid of the diagonal terms. And then you can write the, the system of two equations in terms of a one, a single second order equation, which is of this form here. So uh, R star here, here is, is not the tortoise coordinate in general. It's just uh, any rescale uh, coordinate. So here N, N of R is free, is arbitrary at this point. And what is very uh, important to have in mind is that there is a speed, a propagation speed, which is going to appear in, in the equation. So C is not necessarily one. There is a potential as well. And the, the values and of V and C um, depend on the choice of the rescaling. So let's apply this to the first solution that I, I showed you. So this is a, for the stealth Schwarzschild solution. So these are the explicit values for the, the function, the four function which appear in the system. So, I mean, you don't need to go into the details for this function. So just one important point is that there is a parameter zeta. Uh, zeta is just uh, a combination of Q. So this is a time dependent part of the scalar field and of alpha. So alpha is the first derivative of F, which is in the, Lag the Lagrangian function with respect to X. And you see that when zeta is zero, you recover exactly GR. So the system is exactly like GR if zeta is equal to zero. So zeta is very, a very useful parameter to go away from, from GR. Then what you can notice is that there is a new pole which appears in this function, which is defined by this RG here, which is shifted from, from the, the Schwarzschild radius here by this zeta. 
So if you choose the tortoise coordinates, uh, you find that the speed, the propagation speed is different from one. So in, in contrast with, with GR, and you can even see that this diverges uh, at the Schwarzschild radius. However, you can make another choice, and this is another choice here for R star, and this specific choice guarantees that the speed of propagation is just equal to one in this case. And then with this choice, you, re you get an, a potential, which is very simple, which is of this form. And it turns out that this is exactly, almost exactly the same potential, uh, the same Reggie Wheeler potential as in GR, except that the Schwarzschild radius Rs is replaced by Rg here. And there is a, an overall rescaling by one over one plus zeta. So this is kind of very intriguing to recover potential, which almost exactly look like the GR potential, except that you have a different Schwarzschild radius. So in fact, you can understand this um, rather naturally by invoking a disformal transformation of the type I mentioned earlier. So if you go to a frame where A1 is zero, so A1 was one of the function in the Lagrangian, you recover in fact a tensor, a purely tensor structure, which is exactly like in GR. You see, so if A1 is zero, then uh, the kinetic terms for the tensor modes, the weight of the kinetic terms is going to be the same weight as the gradient terms. So this is why you get a speed of gravitational work gravitational waves, which is equal to one. So this is the condition on the disformal transformation to reach A1 equal to zero. And when you do explicitly the disformal transformation, so it's a bit messy, but you can, you get a cross terms here. You can get rid of this cross term and at the end you recover Schwarzschild. Okay, so it means if you do a disformal transformation of Schwarzschild, you recover a new Schwarzschild with a different Schwarzschild radius here. And this explains why we get this very simple potential. So now let me discuss another approach. So here I've used the, the traditional approach, which is to try to, to rewrite the system as a Schrodinger equation. So now I'm going to use a completely different approach, but this approach is going to be very useful for the polar modes, because the polar modes will turn out to be much more complicated. And, and, and we were unable to find a Schrodinger, a Schrodinger equation for the polar modes. So let me explain this, uh, this other strategy. So the strategy is to use um, the first order equation of motion and to study the asymptotic limits. So if you go, for example, if you look at infinity, special infinity, you start with a system of this form and you just uh, expand, expand the, the matrix M here in terms of, of, the, of the variable. So it's Z here, it, it was R before. And, and there are some, some uh, results, generic results in, in the mathematics literature, which tells you that in general, there are a few ex exceptions you can write the solution, the asymptotic solution, in this form. So this is an exponential of uh, epsilon. So epsilon is, is a diagonal matrix which contains um, polynomials of dead. Delta is also a diagonal matrix, but of constant this time. And f is just a smooth function, which goes to a constant at infinity. And y0 can be seen as just the uh, constants of integration of the system. So you can repeat the same procedure at the horizon and uh, at spatial infinity. And even, even more interesting in the rather recent literature in, in mathematics, um, there was a, you can find a well-defined algorithm in order to determine explicitly the diagonal matrices epsilon and delta. So what we did was to apply this systematic method, which, which comes from the mathematical literature to the case of the quasi-normal modes to the perturbation of black holes. 
So we started with the axial modes because we knew the result with the Schrodinger approach, and then we applied it to the, to the polar modes. So just to, the algorithm is somewhat technical. I'm not going to enter into the details, but the basic idea is to diagonalize order by order this matrix here by doing some change of functions. Okay. So let me illustrate this uh, very quickly with the first solution, the, sorry, the second solution for the non stealth black hole. So we have a system uh, with M and we just expand. So we just need to go to the next two leading order. So this is the first order, the leading order and the next two leading order. And then you can diagonalize step by step. So first you make a change of function to, to diagonalize the first term here. And then another step is to diagonalize the next two leading term. So the final result is the following, where you have a fully diagonalized matrix up to the order you are interested in. And then you can solve it because you have just have independent ordinary differential equation. So you can find the asymptotic behavior at spatial infinity of the, of the corresponding to the two modes here. And, and you, you recognize here, if we introduce the tortoise coordinates, you recognize the ingoing and the outgoing modes. You can do the same procedure at the horizon. And once again, you can identify the ingoing and outgoing modes. So then what, what we did was to uh, try to compute numerically explicitly the quasi-normal modes. And so the idea was to use a, a spectral method, which is a kind of, of uh, usual ID, by imposing the, bound, the correct boundary condition. So here, if you see at this ansatz, so we, input, we give an ansatz where F1 and F2 are free functions, which we want to determine. But the, the ansatz is such that it corresponds to an outgoing mode at spatial infinity and an ingoing mode, as you can see here, at the horizon. Then we, do, we use uh, the usual uh, technical tricks uh, for, for spectral method to introduce Chebyshev polynomials. And we transform the, the differential system into an algebraic system. And then we can solve explicitly in the complex plane for the for the quasi-normal modes. So here at, at the extremities, you have the GR values, and then we change, a we change the value of the parameter zeta or psi here. So there is a parameter, we change, and, and this is how you get the shifts here of the quasi-normal modes. Okay, so we have computed the spectrum for n equals zero, one, and two, and for two values of, of L, the angular, the multiple, the multiple order. Okay, so let's discuss uh, briefly about the polar modes. Um, so the idea of the polar modes, so the polar modes are much more complicated than in general relativity. So the reason is the following. In general relativity, we have only two modes in the system, which are the two tensor modes. So in some sense, the axial modes correspond to one of the gravitational modes and the polar mode correspond to the other tensor mode in GR. And this is why uh, the order of complexity is the same in GR, in, in, the, in the polar and in the axial sector. And you can write another Schrodinger equation in the, in the polar sector, although it's, it's much more subtle. And so it was found much later by Zerilli. So it's, it's possible to rewrite the axial system in terms of a Schrodinger equation. But now in those theories, uh, the situation is, is more complicated because we have still one, one mode in the, in the axial sector, which corresponds to so one, one, uh, one degree of freedom in the axial sector, which corresponds to a, a tensor degree of freedom. But in the polar, in the polar, uh, sector, we have now two degrees of freedom. So one is a gravitational degree of freedom and the other one is a scalar degree of freedom. So it means we get a system which is now four dimensional instead of having, of having four first order, uh, two first order equation, we have now four first order equations with for the following quantities here. 
So even if, uh, so in this context, we have not been able to, to, to obtain a generalized Schrodinger-like system. So there are some models and it has been done in the literature where you can rewrite the system of equation in, in some scalar tensor models in the form of a Schrodinger, a generalized Schrodinger system where the potential goes to zero. So the potential becomes a matrix and goes to zero asymptotically. But in the present case, we are not able to do this and we suspect that it's, it's not possible, but we can still use the asymptotic approach. So in this case, and it's almost my final slide. Uh, in this case, one can compute by using this uh, procedure I explained very quickly. We can study the asymptotic behavior of the system at spatial infinity and near the horizon. And we can extract in this way the asymptotic independent modes, both at the horizon at a special infinity. So for example, if we consider the second solution, the second black hole solution, by, by using this uh, asymptotic approach, we obtain these four modes. So four modes correspond to two degrees of freedom um, at special infinity. So you can recognize that the first two modes are very similar to the modes which we obtain in the axial sectors. So in some sense, we can interpret these modes as the two gravitational modes. So corresponding to the gravitational degree of freedom. And then we have two other modes which have a very peculiar behavior and which we can associate with, uh, with the scalar modes in some sense. We can use the same procedure near the horizon to obtain a similar type of, of matrix. And then what we have also done numerically was to compute uh, the quasi-normal modes in the polar sector and in the axial sector, corresponding to the gravitational asymptotic modes. And so you can see here, this is the plot in the complex plane. And, and you can see that there is a, a breaking between the the what is called the isospectrality between the, the polar and axial perturbations, which is natural in the context of scalar tensor theories. So to conclude, this is a, my last slide. Um, so we have tried to study it in a, in a very generic way, in a very general way, the, the linear perturbation of black holes in scalar tensor theories. So here I've, I've illustrated the approach with two different models, but the idea is that it could be applied to, to any type of model. So for axial modes, we recover a Schrodinger-like equation, but we have to be careful because the propagation speed can be different from one. So it really depends on the coordinate system or on the frame where, where you are. Um, something which is, which, which is somewhat puzzling, but I think we have a nice interpretation with this disformal transformation is that for the stealth black hole, in fact, the gravitational waves are going to see a Schwarzschild metric, which is different from the original Schwarzschild metric, because you have a shift in the, in the horizon. So in some sense, the gravity sees a metric which is different from the original metric. Then for the polar modes, the, the structure is much more complicated, but we have developed a systematic approach to decouple the modes uh, asymptotically. And in the future, we like to apply this, uh, this approach to other solutions and, and, uh, and try to extract the quasi-normal modes. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. Uh, now there is uh, time for questions. Can either either you raise your hand or you just uh, speak. And, uh, actually, I, I can maybe start with one question. Um, is there some hope uh, to distinguish uh, um, 
so, so, so we discussed about the solutions uh, with, um, uh, let's say, time-dependent solution, which there is a background uh, uh, mu t, right. um, for, and, and, and solution like Gauss-Bonet, which there is no, um, no background. So in terms of perturbation, this uh, may leave some imprint, or there is no distinction? Yes, in, in, in fact, when we were fighting with, uh, struggling with the equations, we discovered that everything looks very different when this Q is different from zero. Hmm. Um, and I would say it's usually much more complicated in, in this sense. So, I think at present we don't have a kind of general statement saying that for all solutions which will contain this this kind of time dependent behavior, then we have this kind of uh, features which are going to appear. Okay. But my suspicion is just by really playing with the equations that something special was was happening when we had this uh, this uh, time time dependence. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't see the, the hand. I, I have a question, if I yes. may. Uh, yes, sorry. Well, George, go ahead. There is also a, a, some question by Nikos. Yeah. So, um, I have a, a bit general question, but since you mentioned this transformation between different frames, so people in about Brans Dicke theory and Higgs inflation and so they very often they say that Jordan and Einstein frame are completely equivalent. And uh, I never understood this because it depends how it comes to the rest of the meta. And I think that's what you say. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, let me try to, to go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, yes, so you, you, you are perfectly right. This is very similar to the to the conformal transformation in the con in the context of traditional Brandsdicke type theories, and um, so what people mean when they say that this is completely equivalent to go in in the Jordan frame or the Einstein frame, is that they have in mind that in the Einstein frame the coupling of matter to the metric will be non-trivial. It's not a minimal coupling. So in some sense, you, you start in the Jordan frame. In the Jordan frame, the matter is minimally coupled to the metric. And then you move to the Einstein frame, where the, the Lagrangian is simpler for the metric, but the price to pay is that the coupling is non-minimal. So here, you could, you could play the same, the same game in some sense. You could go from a frame here with the metric G minu, where the metric is, uh, is minimally coupled, for example. And you could move to a new frame with G til, mu to, G til the metric G til, and a matter which would be non-minimally coupled to G til. And then the two would be equivalent. Yes. So the two are equivalent yes. if you have minimal coupling of the matter to the metric in one frame, but not in the other, not in the other frame. So now, if you have your two frame and you impose minimal coupling in the two frames, then your theories are not equivalent. I hope it it clarifies. Yeah. So I'm asking this question because for particular reason, but Pet, I think I send you email, and then we can uh, discuss also. Okay. Yeah, thank you, okay. thank you. Okay, where the paper, uh, where the, sorry, a question uh, uh, by Nikos Kapsinos. Uh, hello, hello. Yes, uh, if you could uh, possibly go by to the axial perturbation section uh, where you derive the effective uh, potential uh, here, here. So, uh, my understanding is that uh, due to the DOS theory, there is a non-unitary non uh, velocity for the perturbation. And uh, you said that actually you used the redefinition of the tortoise coordinate in order to make this uh, velocity equal to one. Is that, um, am I understanding correctly so far? Yes, exactly. So. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my issue here, actually my question, not my issue, uh, is uh, 
If uh, you actually use this uh, redefinition of the um, tortoise coordinate, wouldn't this create a cross term between, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, a d psi 1 dr, uh, d t dr, uh, d psi 1 dt? And uh, what does this term, what would this term mean for the perturbation? Is it like a like a friction term for the per, uh, for the perturbation of the for the um, propagation of the gravitational wave? Um, uh, I can I can re recast my question if I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't clear enough. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I understood fully the question. So let's okay, okay. Let me try to answer. So indeed, when okay. So when you have this, um, when you do this, this formal transformation, for example, okay. you get a cross term, as you were saying here. Yes. But, but then the trick is simply to, to use, I mean, we are using the freedom to choose the coordinate system. And in fact, there is a coordinate system where, where the equation are much simpler. So, so if you go to this new coordinate system, uh, and the metric is exactly the same here. So here I'm, I'm working with the same metric after the deformed transformation. So it, it means somehow that there is a, a static, a static symmetry. So there is a, a static killing vector which is hidden here, and and you okay. can use uh, time redefinition to make it transparent. So in some sense, you go to a coordinate system where the metric looks the simplest possible. And, and this, this formal transformation, so, so this is a, doing this procedure by using the disformal transformation, but you can also do it by ignoring totally uh, the disformal transformation, just by doing it at the level of the equation of motion. So this is completely equivalent to doing a disformal transformation, but here we don't do a disformal transformation. We simply redefine the time in order to get rid of these uh, diagonal terms. And once we got rid of these diagonal terms, we can write explicitly a Schrodinger equation. Uh, uh, yes, uh, but uh, 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 my question is the following, that uh, here uh, C of R is non-unitary, right? So no, C of R depends, depends on the, so it's a bit different, you see. There is a time transformation, which, yes. is, which is on one side, and there is another possibility, uh, another transformation, which is just a purely radial coordinate transformation. And if you change the radial coordinate, then you are going to change this, uh, this propagation speed. So in some sense, these are two different things. There is one okay. where you change the time coordinate to make the, the equation nicer, and there is another possibility where you simply change the radial coordinate. And if you change the radial coordinate, you change, you change the propagation speed and you change the potential at the same time. Uh, but, but okay. These two aspects are decoupled. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's uh, time to move on. So let's uh, thank uh, David.